capped at nine meters per second. So that's less than half the speed of the other two blasts. Okay. Excellent. Uh, okay, the sound. So the stealth, what I call it, stealth ability? Stealth ability. Stealth ability. Okay, so we use the decibel meter to find out which of these are the quietest. Uh, there's a lot of factors uh, in the sound that comes off a drone. You know, the pitch being a major one. They sound different when they're maneuvering than when they're hovering. But the only way to really do a viable test here was to control all variables and do a basically measure while hovering indoors without any wind. So that's what we did. Uh, it turns out that large and small categories, all these drones are pretty much the same volume. They all come in at like 82 to 84 decibels, uh, except the M30T. It's way louder. All right. Um, okay, now this one, this one is a fascinating one. I'll jump in after you. This is GPS denied performance, and I have a public safety service announcement after Fraser. But give us the uh, give us the GPS denied on these platforms, Fraser. Okay, so this is a lot less clear cut. Like this is not a quantitative assessment, right? Uh, but but here's what we got. Uh, we do want to try to give some comparison. So so of course uh, it's going to be subjective. But in the small category, the Nafi USA, the Mavic 3 Thermal, and the Evo 2 Enterprise. Uh, they all work pretty much the same way when there's no GPS. They use other sensors to enable position hold capability uh, instead of GPS. That works pretty well, um, generally speaking. The Inafi USA only has a downward sensor, so we, we should give an edge to the other two platforms uh, based on that. Um, however, in a confined space indoors, like we're actually not really using obstacle avoidance. Uh, when obstacle avoidance is enabled, drones basically can't move indoors uh, because there's obstacles nearby. So generally we're disabling obstacle avoidance and making use of those sensors only for position hold capability. So it doesn't matter all that much whether we have all around sensors or just downward sensors because we don't really need that dynamic obstacle avoidance going on. So bottom line here is that if you're flying carefully and you have decent lighting in the environment, which is important for all these systems, uh, all three of the small ones can be flown in GPS denied environments with pretty similar results. So uh, it's hard to give a clear winner here. Pilot skill is going to be a much bigger factor than the, the choice of drone. So that's all we can say. For the larger systems, M30T, and the Autel Max 4T, they work pretty much the same way as the smaller systems. They have uh, all around obstacle avoidance sensors. We have to disable those. They're enabling position hold. That's all fine. Not a big difference from the smaller platforms. But obviously, the Skydio X10 is, is quite different. It's relying on a really advanced obstacle avoidance system uh, enabled by visual sensors. That's really the sort of standout feature of Skydio platforms in general, and, and also with the X10, and that's really their secret sauce. Uh, with the X10, we can reduce the bubble size of the obstacle avoidance, and we really can make use of that indoors. Um, so that, that does help quite a lot. Uh, there's a bit of a caveat there, which we'll touch on when we get into flight characteristics, but for now I'll just say um, that the X10 and Skydio platforms in general they're not quite as sharp or crisp in flight characteristics, difficult to maneuver them precisely, and that is a challenge uh, in indoor environments. Right. Thanks, Trace. So I'll, I'll add my, my public service uh, announcement here. So don't use any of these platforms uh, indoors, uh, especially for kind of tactical stuff. If you're in a giant warehouse, different, different story, that's a little better. But if you're in some kind of uh, scenario where you're going through rooms or you're trying to get through doors, don't, don't do it. Your best bet is is something as small as possible, and uh, and and probably without obstacle avoidance. And a lot of the challenges we had, and we tested these extensively for indoor tactical operations, is Skydios and all these platforms with obstacle avoidance. They often can't get through doors; their obstacle avoidance won't let them. The X two D is actually, uh, sorry, the X ten is a big platform, uh, and it's it's you know going to have trouble even without obstacle fitting through a door. So. You have purpose-built drones for this that are cheap and durable. Uh, get those, and that can be, um, you know, some of the old-style brinks, the low keys. There's a million people now building cheap FPV drones, which is, I think, is the way to go. So, get a purpose-built drone for this. Do not be risking your expensive 
uh, drones for these types of operations, please. All right, flight characteristics. Again, a, a, a qualitative one as opposed to quantitative, but, uh, but again, we have, uh, we have finicky pilots and uh, they have a lot of opinions and uh, so let's hear them. Sure, so in this case, it's, it's kind of appropriate to just lump all six together. Like there's no real distinction between large or small um, because that, that really doesn't, the size really doesn't have much bearing on uh, how they perform in, in the air in terms of the, the, the feel uh, of the flight characteristics. So they all fly perfectly well. Uh, there's no real uh, complaints from anybody, and despite how finicky our, our opinions may be about flight characteristics of these platforms. Um, worth pointing out a couple of, uh, a couple of items though. Uh, DJI is and remains the sort of standard in a lot of areas, and especially in, in flight characteristics. They've always been extremely um, crisp, predictable, responsive, and, and that continues to be the benchmark that we measure everything else against. Uh, the Inafi USA has always been on par, and what, uh, what, what's neat about the Inafi USA platform is that it's very customizable we can control those max attitude, yaw rate, uh, max speed, uh, and so on uh, very precisely. And we can save presets of these profiles that are appropriate, for example, for indoor use, outdoor use, max speed and rates and minimum speed and rates and so on. And so it's really the only platform that gives us the ability to customize the flying experience. And that's, that's very cool. Uh, for some reason, nobody else has done that yet. The Scadio X10, uh, like other Scadio platforms that we've tried, uh, falls on the other side of this. Um, not very crisp controls, really feels like it's lacking in precision. You will experience a delayed response to your control inputs. And uh, we've always thought that this is really related to Scadio's philosophy on, uh, on, on the design, uh, which is to rely heavily on optical avoidance, uh, optical flow where the drone uh, really is flying itself. That's true of all drones, but in the case of the Skydios, it almost feels like when you give a control input on the GCS, you're suggesting that it does something and it will do something kind of like that, like a second or two later. Um, this is not to say it's overall a downside, uh, but it's worth pointing out because for a lot of pilots, this will be very different than, uh, than what they're used to. Perfect, okay. Uh, GCS is often an underrated uh, comparison point. So uh, let's let's talk about that in a little bit of detail, Frisch. For sure. So fortunately, we have them all here. Uh, touch on the Anafi USA, first of all. Uh, many of you may have not seen there's a new version of the Anafi USA, <laughs> Anafi USA GCS. This is a pretty significant improvement. Uh, of course, they've always had the, the upgraded version, which is the Sky Controller USA significantly more expensive. That's not really what we're talking about right now. For the basic GCS version, this is a huge upgrade. Uh, it's quite similar to what came out with the Inafi AI. Um, I mean, it sort of speaks for itself, but uh, the, the, the device grip is much better. Uh, the size is better. It enables us to use larger device, balanced much better, um, and so on. So it's still lacking an integrated screen. For many folks, that's gonna be a major downside that is one of the contributing factors to the slower deployment time. Um, however, we really like Parrot's uh, GUI. The, the control interface is very good. The Free Flight 6 and Free Flight 6 USA apps are, are fantastic. Um, they have all the things we, we've come to expect from uh, very much like a DJI or Autel uh, control app, but uh, arranged in a very interesting way. And, and of course, we have the customizability. So, so that's, that's really neat. The Mavic 3, could you, could you pass me that, Kevin? Great, so Mavic 3 and the Autel Evo 2 app, or sorry, uh, GCSs, both have integrated screens. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, they both have integrated screens, although the Autel's screen is much, much bigger. Uh, it may even be bigger than an M30T controller, which we'll get to later. So. Uh, very large screen, if that's important to you, take note of this. However, the Mavic 3 uh, Enterprise Controller, it's a smaller screen, but 
it's it's much more ergonomic. It's kind of hard to deny that. Uh, it feels much better to me uh, to use. Uh, despite the small screen, it's also got um, much more functionality with physical controls, more buttons, a programmable four-way switch, uh, better scroll wheels. And so for me, uh, again, this is very subjective, but I prefer to use that uh, than have a larger screen. But that's just because for me, a large screen is not particularly uh, important. Moving on to the, the three larger platforms, we have to take note that the larger platforms are IP rated. And so usability of the GCS in adverse weather becomes a factor here, uh, and that's, that's gonna be relevant. So the Max 4T controller is actually going to be the same uh, as the Evo 2 GCS. Okay, so uh, large screen does have lots of physical controls, not as many as a DJI controller, for example, but, uh, but, but there you have it. Uh, worth pointing out, there's also a smaller version of this. Uh, like if for some reason you wanted uh, a smaller screen, uh, more portable controller, that, that is an option. Thank you. The, uh, actually, we'll get to that one last. Let's go to this one here. The Stadio uh, X10 controller, like the X2D controller, is uh, a little different. We and we, we love the X2D controller, didn't we? We absolutely did. Yes, There's a did. lot of things to like about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems a little bit trivial, but this, this in integrated cover, which covers the screen and control sticks, uh, is really great. It means if, if you wanted to, you can easily stuff this in a pack, not worry about breaking your control sticks. This also serves as the antenna and as a shield over the screen for glare or rain uh, or, or what have you. So we really like that. I also want to point out the build quality and ergonomics of this controller are like really good. Uh, Skydio hardware is always uh, excellent. So that's, that's, I guess, no surprise. Uh, about the, the GUI of Skydio's uh, control app, it's clean, it's flexible. We have lots of different configurations possible of picture in picture. So if you want various configurations of your thermal and your map and your RGB image, that's all possible. Uh, it's very cool. However, it relies really heavily on interaction with the touchscreen. Just, I mean, for example, you, you can't even land the drone without interacting with the touchscreen. And so if you've got cold fingers, rain on your touchscreen, if you're wearing gloves, like that's kind of a problem. So keep that in mind. The M30T controller, okay, this is called the DJI RC Plus. I really can't say enough about this. Um, as soon as this came out, we appreciated that it was probably the best GCS for uh, any, any drone of any type that we've ever seen so far. So uh, what are the benefits of this? Well, first of all, three scroll wheels, okay? So there's always one dedicated to uh, zoom, and another to payload yaw, which people don't often think about payload yaw as being relevant, but we'll see, uh, we'll touch on a moment why sometimes it is. Uh, case dependent uh, function buttons here on the sides, which basically change the function of those depending on what screen, what payload we're looking at, uh, et cetera. And that means we can perform most functions with gloves on. Um, we've also got really good port covers, large screen, great ergonomics, build quality is good. Uh, this is just a great controller. I, I kind of can't say enough about, uh, about that. Okay, thank you. So there you go. Um, all right, so let's get into some sensor data, shall we? This is uh, this was some great stuff, uh, and I'm sure what a lot of you are looking for. So we're going to start with the RGB sensor, uh, and so let's 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 get into that. Yeah, so we'll we'll just show uh, rather than tell. Although okay. I, I will continue talking. There you go. But Ariel, if you could roll that. Okay, so we're looking at a license plate of uh, a beautiful truck. I might add, it's sexy as there hell. You go. Right. Uh, so this was taken from 100 meters away. Um, for the smaller platforms, this almost is too great of a distance to really give a viable test. But as we can see, there's one platform that's actually doing quite a good job. So the Mavic 3 thermal, obviously we're using the telephoto lens here. Uh, you can easily read that plate uh, from 100 meters away. The Inafi USA, um, 
I don't know if the audience can really see that based on the the amount of uh, the, the layers of tech that this image is going through, but that is a legible plate uh, from the raw image. And by the way, you, you can download the raw image files uh, when we post them and, and assess for yourself. The Autel Evo 2, uh, we totally cannot read the plate from this, this distance. And this is really just showing the limitations of a single sensor RGB configuration. So both the Mavic 3 and the Inafi USA have a dual uh, sensor with different lenses, different lens configuration on each sensor. Um, and that's what enables this type of zoom performance without having optical zoom, which is lens elements moving inside a larger payload. Uh, and so you can have a very high resolution sensor, uh, but if it's a single sensor starting from a relatively wide field of view, you can really only do so much with blowing up those pixels. Uh, and so here's, here's the result. Excellent. Okay, let's, let's head to the next one. Okay, so the larger platforms, uh, obviously we can see right away that this is like an order of magnitude better performance. These platforms have optical zoom capability which means lens elements moving mechanically inside the, the payload in front of the sensor to achieve uh, this, this, uh, this magnification. I, I mean, it's pretty clear here that the, the M30T is the winner. That's pretty shocking um, image, like resolution, sharpness at that range. Uh, we know that it can, it can read plates at a much larger range, uh, but it's for the purposes of sort of comparing and assessing um, we can see here that it's it's definitely um, it's definitely superior to the others. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's worth noting is when we did this, it was uh, it was a, a light rainy day, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't like a crystal clear day either. So the camera optics were dealing with some challenging uh, circumstances. Um, and uh, and I thought it was an interesting result from Skydio how they dealt with that, but obviously clearly still. Uh, still legible, but it does it does look significantly different from the other two images. Yeah, I mean, um, Sk Skydio's website claims they can read a license plate from 800 feet. Here's what it looks like from from 300 feet. Uh, it's not clear to me actually which is better uh, of the uh, the Max 4T or the the, the X10 um, at this range anyway. Uh, it, it seems that at a longer range, the uh, the X10 may be maybe a winner. We'll have to assess. Uh, anyway, again, download these yourself, the raw image files, take a look if you like. And I think, you know, when we get to the pricing and performance rate ratio and everything, the, 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 the key takeaway is also that all three of these platforms are, are, as you would expect, being more expensive, better than the smaller platforms. But I think what stuck out for me, we'll talk about, is how actually good the smaller platforms were. And that will be, you know, we'll talk about that, what that means later. Okay, uh, some terminals. Uh, we've got, more we've some, got, we got one more. One more? So right, just for fun, we did this at uh, night. Um, we tried this with the smaller platforms. We didn't really get any meaningful results. But here's um, the same license plate from 60 meters away at night. Again, this is the RGB main sensor, not a thermal sensor. Um, hmm. With the M30T, that's a clearly legible plate. Yep. Uh, again, the raw image file is probably much better than what the audience is seeing right now. Um, at night, the Autel was uh, clearly superior to the X10. Um, again, I'm not sure how clear that is uh, from right here, but when I did my assessment, yeah, the, the Max 4T is doing much better at night with its main sensor zoomed in than is the X10. However, I think, Kevin, you're going to say that we do not have... Uh, th there's a nighttime payload option available for Skydio. So I'll let you I'll let you touch on that. Yeah. So all, all of these platforms, all of these platforms have uh have uh external lighting and Skydio actually has lighting that's a built right into the sensor, which is pretty cool. So for these types of uh these types of applicants, we'll we'll do some more testing with lights. Um uh so it's worth noting that that uh that there are options to uh to improve these for these platforms as well. Yeah, and uh, the Max 4T also has a an N version with a starlight sensor. That is not what we're testing Correct. here. Um, however, the the M30T it uh, there's a function called night scene or night mode that's auto enabled. That's what we're seeing here. Uh, it it's awesome, right? And I, I would assume that the Max 4T uh, in the night version would would be equally good. Okay. So. 
that uh, okay, Ariel, you can cut back to us. So for uh, there's so many variables with IR imagery of obviously delta between the subject temperature, ambient temperature, what type of material is it? Uh, so we, we didn't try to capture any imagery to compare because it, it just really wouldn't be a, a viable test, um, not with the controls we have here anyway. So let's talk about the sensor and lens configurations. All these platforms um, have the same the same resolution on the thermal sensor, except the Inafi USA. So uh, it's significantly lower resolution. That, of course, means uh, its performance is, is not as good. That's especially true at longer ranges. Uh, it's unfortunately just not uh, in the same category as, as the other platforms. Um, the field of view becomes really relevant here because the tighter the framing, the more pixels are on your target. And so what we looked at is which platforms have the tightest field of view. They are the Max 4T. Autel has always done relatively narrow field of view on their thermal sensors. I think that's the right design decision. Uh, and this, the Skydio X10 also has a uh, 41 degree field of view, which is relatively tight. So again, that's just giving us better uh, think of it as GSD, ground sampling distance, but this also applies to uh, scenarios other than mapping. It's how many pixels are on your, your subject, on your target. Uh, and this is especially important with thermal sensors because the resolution is just so low to begin with. Um, there's an asterisk on this. The M30T has a super resolution, I believe that's what it's called, mode for, for the thermal imager. Um, that's software trickery. Okay, but it does work quite well. So it, it, there's, I have to just put an asterisk there. Um, thermal images look great with the M30T, but it, it's not the same as having uh, a tighter field of view or, or a better sensor. Okay, fantastic. And we, we, will, we will have some, some, some other raw images uh, available in the, in the written report. Um, but I mean, overall, I, I, think we were, um, I think we were pretty, pretty impressed with uh, the performance of all of them. Um, I, I do think we need to single it out because it is a pretty vast improvement and we maybe talk about it later, but, um, but maybe just a quick, quick word about the Skydio thermal sensor and, and some additional thoughts on that one. Yeah. So I, I believe the, uh, the X2 series still had a 640 uh, resolution sensor. Um, but we're seeing really good results from the, the X10. Uh, the narrow field of view is really important. Um, and so, so, yeah, like, again, we're, we're, we're calling it out that it's, it's one of the best ones we've seen here because uh, the results were good. Right. And sorry, and that's my bad. It, the, the X2D actually was a 320 as well. Was it? Yeah, they oh. were all 320. So was the deal. They were all still 320. So okay. I'm getting old. I forget. No, things. no, no. Uh, that, that was my mistake. So then it is a big improvement, of course. Yeah. Okay. So uh, before we get into the individual uh, individual discussions, uh, let's lastly talk about some cool features because there's certainly some of these platforms that have some really standout things that we're not maybe directly compared that we want to uh, we want to highlight for uh, for people for their consideration. So yeah. So this is a bit of a wild card because it's very much not apples to apples, and so it doesn't really apply to any kind of comparison. Um, and we also can't go through an exhaustive list of the, the features here. But let's point out some of the important ones. So M30T, uh, it's got some features which we kind of think of as, as uh, standard for that, that category now, the laser range finder, which enables us to do pinpoints. Uh, those, as anyone who's seen or used them knows, are very uh, relevant uh, functions. And then the object tracking as well, um, which, is, which is, is very neat. So for uh, Max 4T, it again has a laser range finder, AI object recognition, and counting of those objects, and it will place them on the map for you and show the coordinates of those, those objects. Uh, again, this, you know, it's, it's, it is pretty cool. The screen and the map can tend to get quite cluttered. Uh, you can disable this function, but if you're trying to count individuals in a crowd, vehicles in a lot, uh, and understand their location, like it does that automatically. It's it's very cool. Can you comment on the, some of the X10's standout features? So yeah, so the the X10. I mean, listen, Skydio. You know, Skydio's foundational thing is their is their obstacle avoidance platform, uh, and uh, and it 
it's it's the most it's certainly the most advanced one so um so there is that it's actually quite impressive when you are uh even in inside of larger buildings with uh, some smaller things um so it is uh, it's a really impressive technology if you have uh if you have use cases uh for it that's that's the first one uh secondly they do have um they do have a bunch of add-on features that you can get the 3d scan or 360 scan software is is actually pretty impressive we'll we'll talk about that more in uh when we do the scanning session that we'll we'll talk about a bit later um and then uh and then they also have a night vision one uh so certainly for the x2d there was real issues of it working and functioning at night as there is um but uh with some of the other platforms um uh, but they have uh, they have an option again it costs more money to do it but there's also a night performance mode that should uh, and will significantly improve the uh, performance of light and they have some really interesting features like the light on the uh on the sensor as well um so overall some really really uh, interesting stuff uh for uh, for sky for the smaller platforms um really aren't any distinguishing features that would that would sort of put one uh, above the other um certainly none of the smart features uh, that we've that we've just talked about here so um nothing uh, major to say about features for this the small uh, smaller platforms the mavic the autel the anafi usa uh, specs aside from a feature point of view they all do essentially the same thing fantastic all right so uh let's uh let's talk about the platforms so let's 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 go. We're gonna go through this pretty quick. Uh, Aria, what do we got? What do we got up first? Anafi USA. So uh, uh, just a note on the uh, on the pricing for these. These are uh, these are uh, approximate Canadian dollar prices. So uh, so for Americans, then obviously things are a little different with tariffs and things like that. Uh, but this should give you a ballpark of uh, of what it is. So this is the Anafi USA. This is it. Okay, so some general characteristics. This is a little smaller and lighter than the other two small platforms that we've talked about today. It's only 400 grams. So I guess I'll ask you, Kevin, where is this the most appropriate? Who should get this rather than one of the other two? So it's it's a it's a great question. So for uh for one of the non-Chinese made platforms, it is uh it is Price and performance very 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 solid, and so if you have issues where um, you interact with border patrol or different areas where they're a little bit more sensitive about using uh, Chinese products, this is this is probably the best way uh, to go uh, in in the uh, in the in the dot gov. So the big thing about this is, as we'll talk about in the blue SUAS, those platforms are approximately double the cost of uh, most of these ones. Parrot's done a really smart thing with this. They've they've made it with a standard non-NDA compliant controller. So it's the same drone as the blue drone, but it is not using an NDA compliant controller. So for a lot of your compliance, that's going to be fine because it's still it's still not Chinese made. Uh, and so that gives you the opportunity to use it. It's a really good all-around platform. So although I don't recommend doing it, if you do have to use it for internal things, it has the advantage of being small. There are prop guards available for it, um, and uh, and it's a good opportunity for that. Also has decent range for uh, for again the non OcuSync or Autel uh, platforms. Yeah. Also, uh, anyone who needs a small drone that's IP rated, correct? This is the only one. It's IP fifty three, I believe. Correct. Is that right? Forty three. For, okay, forty three. So uh, you can fly this in the rain, even according to Transport Canada. Uh, it's the only one of the small platforms we tested. Uh, and we're speaking about in this session, uh, which is IP rated. Uh, just to recap specs, in terms of flight time, flight performance, and everything else, uh, it, it's not inferior in any way. It's very much in the middle of the pack uh, on all those areas, despite being a significantly older platform. Uh, so all around a, a very good choice, uh, especially if you, if you need something IP rated or if you're inclined to buy something that's not Chinese. Exactly. Excellent. Okay, so the Anafi AI, um, we just really didn't have time to include the sort of mapping inspection platforms in the session today. Uh, more detail available in the report that's that's coming. Um, but this platform overall is an excellent choice for any mapping or inspection 
applications. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll add to that just a little bit. We we will be we will be testing all the map, mapping capabilities of this along, as well as the Mavic 3 Enterprise. Uh, we will be testing that along with the fixed wing lidars. So uh, we'll uh, we'll have Ted Stradsmeri uh, joining us for those tests. We'll have a separate session that really deals with it. Uh, but to echo Fraser, this is primarily a platform that's used for mapping, also IP rated. So um, for a lot of those uh, kind of collision scene mappings where you need an all-purpose drone. Uh, it's a great opportunity, and it's also um, integrates directly with uh, with Pix40. Uh, and then you also have the ability; it has LTE built right in. So if you have any weird buildings in your areas, uh, you're going to be able to uh, to fly through LTE. Excellent. All right, the autels. Okay, so Evo twos. The one we have here is a 640T. Um, I, I'll ask you first, Kevin, what do you think this is This is really for and who should buy this? So uh, this is actually a price point. Uh, so I think you can get into, uh, it's about, uh, as we've got on there, a 6K is, is under 3,000 Canadian dollars for this. This is gonna give you a fantastic platform in terms of flight time, range, durability, flight characteristics. Everything. So for a basic kind of, I need to take pictures. I need to do some basic inspection. I need to, uh, I need to do a little bit of mapping. So if you're, if you're getting into the business for a first drone or you're doing kind of PR stuff, this is actually a great opportunity for that. And it has a lot of really advanced features like the obstacle avoidance uh, that go through. So th this is a really, really solid choice uh, for that. Yeah, where it really stands out is uh, the robustness of the build quality for one. Uh, the last time we did this about three years ago, somebody stepped on uh, an Evo 2, and it, it, we actually just kept flying it. Like, I don't even think the, the propeller broke. Uh, it's also got the longest flight time, generally good performance, especially on the thermal sensor uh, because of that narrow field of view. Um, as we saw, being a single RGB sensor only, the zoom performance not quite as good as the, the Inafi uh, USA or as the, the Mavic 3, uh, but nevertheless, a good all-around platform, uh, especially solid one. Plus it's orange. That's right. Yeah. So we we have a number of these in service in Canada. And uh, so it's it's excellent. On on the on the downside with these, uh, Autel service can can still be hit and miss. It's something that Autel really needs to improve. Um, and so that's that's something you want to consider when you're looking at these if you're not uh, if you're not handy and you're not particularly close to a dealer that's going to be able to help you out. Um, also, these are now uh, fully compliant with uh, Transport Canada. Uh, advanced operations, so you're good to go with this in the Max Tour team. All right, next one. Do we want to add anything uh, about the uh, 640? Um, well, the the sample imagery we saw today was from the 640T. Uh, so again, I'll just I'll just reiterate that the, the the camera performance is quite good, although single sensor only, so you're limited to digital zoom. Uh, and uh, we know that the thermal camera performance is quite good thanks to that uh, narrower field of view. Right. So again, solid solid price point for the quality you're going to get. Uh, and, and again, as as Autel tends to be a, a solid uh, solid platform. All right, the Max 4T. So we'll get into some of these medium sized ones here. All right, so as you can see, this is this is a little bigger. This is the the Max 4T uh, from from Autel. Thoughts? So you can see you can see the difference in size of these platforms, and and we'll get it. So this is the smallest of the medium sized platforms. We'll show we'll show it to you relative to the other ones. Not a huge uh, huge one. So um, overall, again, I think I think we saw it. This is this is the Autel. This is this is Autel in a nutshell. I think it's it's very well priced. It's it's a very solid platform. Very advanced features. Um, I I like that it's a little bit smaller than the M30T, so a little bit more portability. Uh, and again, you have a solid but unspectacular uh, sensor, so you can do most of the things that you're you're going to need to do for uh, a mix of different types of, of of things. So it's it's also a good all arounder. What are your thoughts, Trey? Agreed, 100%. Like, you're not trading off that much uh, zoom camera quality against the Mavic, or sorry, against the M30T, 
but you're getting more flight time, a smaller size, uh, cheaper batteries, uh, better price point for the whole system. So all around a good choice. And, and frankly, I've been surprised that uh, we're not seeing more of these out in the marketplace. Agreed. Agreed. Um, okay, let's move on. Okay, so actually, let's let's leave that up. I do I do want to do a quick little little side by side so people can see it, Fraser. Then we'll then we'll give the M thirty T. So it's probably you can again you can kind of get a feel. I think uh, Ariel, if we want to flip it over to the, you can kind of get a feel for for the size for the size difference. So it's it's a little bit it's a little bit smaller. Um, so it is a more compact platform. Okay, M30T, what can we say about that? Um, this is often referred to here in our office as possibly the best all around general use drone for public safety and inspection that we've ever seen. Um, it gives us most of the capability of a larger platform like an M300 with an H20T uh, at a significantly lower price point. It's more portable, it's very quick to deploy, even faster than a Mavic. Um, I don't know what else I can say about that. It's just exceptional all around. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I'm with Fraser, IP rated, every, everything you're going to want. Um, and so there, this category I'll talk about at the end, there's some interesting challenges for this particular category. Uh, but we'll, we'll save that until after Skydo and it applies to all three of the platforms. But again, very interesting platform. So you can see. You can see you have a significant size difference between the small and the and the and the medium SUAS. Um, but again, you get you get longer flight times, you get better sensors as you've seen. So there's a lot of advantages to this if you're going to be uh, single platforms. Let, let's reiterate, and we can't show it right now, but the packed size of these yes, is not that different. Correct. Like the the Max 4T, the uh, the the Skydio X10, and the M30T, they pack into a hard case that's really not much bigger than a, a smaller drone. So uh, while they are bigger drones, uh, that's not always such an important difference. All right. Okay, the Mavic 3 Enterprise. Here we have it, back to a slightly smaller platform. Um, Again, this is sort of setting the standard for, for what is the smaller uh, of, of the categories we have. Uh, it's a little bit smaller than an Evo 2. Um, I mean, it's a DJI drone. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. No one's going to be disappointed with this decision. Uh, any specific thoughts, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, really, there's really not much to say. To me, to me, it's an interesting comparison for you know, just over 4,000 for this kit versus just under 3000 for for a 6k um i think this one is is certainly more versatile but again if you're price conscious there there, there is a decision to get made for sure uh but make make no doubt that this is this is the quality standard um you know as much as you 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 may you may uh uh have issues with chinese production or whatever that really it's the standard so uh you can't you can't possibly go wrong with this one. Um, I'm looking forward to showing you the test results uh, for the mapping. Again, I think when you look at the questions of this, you get some really fun decisions where you say, can I map with this platform versus mapping with say a P1 camera on an M350, uh, or we'll do some testing when we do that of the uh, M3, uh, M3D for the, for the dock, so. Yeah. Um... What was really surprising about this when it first came out was the the RGB camera quality. So when the Parrot and Afi USA first came out, it was over three years ago, or about three years ago now, I think, uh, that had the dual RGB sensor on such a small platform. That was pretty revolutionary. Um, and we got great results uh, with that. Being a much newer platform, uh, they've done the same thing, but really improved the performance. And so, it's amazing the zoom capability we can get from such a small platform. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that used in all sorts of interesting uh, use cases around the world these days. Excellent. The, the downside uh, about DJI, and I'll, I'll toot our own horn, is, um, is you, you can get DJI from a lot of places. And there's a massive variance in the quality 
of the service and the quality of the knowledge that you're going to get from uh, different tiers of dealers for this product. So um, I will I will tell you choose your partners very carefully. These are everybody prices them the same generally. Uh, so buy you know buy from who you want to buy from. Don't I know for some of you, you got to go procurement and get three quotes. Fine, get your three quotes, but they all should be in the same range. So nobody's nobody's going to get ripped off uh, buying these. But choose choose your partner. That's one of the challenges when you have uh, lots of options for that. Okay, what what do we got next? Mavic Three Thermal. Well, here it is. Here it is indeed. I mean, this is the, this is globally. I believe this is probably going to be by far. I don't have any stats, but I know that they're buying them in Europe by the skid loads. This is the best-selling drone, commercial type drone in the world. Uh, it's a pain in the ass to get right now in North America. Uh, I think we all know why, uh, but you uh, you can get an allocation. So this is one where again, check around with your dealer. We we get it. We get a certain allocation every month, uh, so it varies month to month. Um, but you saw from the imagery and and when you see the the raw files, it's. I mean, this is the industry standard, right? I mean, I don't I don't want to sound gushy. I hate to be gushy on these things, but. Yeah, uh, I guess one thing I will say, um, DJI's when we're talking about the thermal sensors, they don't use as narrow of a field of view as as uh, for example, Autel does. Um, it's not a decision that I agree with. Uh, I mean, you can see more area at once. But you see less detail. You're flying a drone. You can pan the camera. You can move ridiculously fast. So, in my point of view, a narrower field of view with more detail on target is more relevant than a wider swath uh, that you can see at any one moment. Uh, so, I would just point out that the the thermal capability in that respect not quite as good as some of the direct uh, competitors, but but still a 640 resolution sensor. So that's industry standard. Fantastic. All right. Okay, and now for the Skydio X10, let's take a look at this one. So first thing to note, obviously we've grouped this in with our larger or medium-sized platforms. This is not really a successor to the Skydio X2 Enterprise drone. It is a much larger, um, Feature packed and more expensive platform. So again, it's slightly, slightly smaller than an M30T. So obviously, this is this is new to most Canadians and most people. These are not in uh, in wide production yet, so you don't typically see them out there. So Fraser, you 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 have flown and trained pretty extensively on the X2Ds. What did you think of this one? Well, uh, I was very pleasantly surprised by the sensor performance. I mean, the, the actual like data collection sensors. So the thermal camera, uh, much improved, but especially the zoom performance on the, on the RGB sensors, it was really good. Um, I, I guess I don't really know what I was expecting, but it's, it's very much in class with the M30T uh, and the, the, the Autel uh, Max 4. T so that uh, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but but anyway, that's a, that's a comment that I have. It's it's really good, um, especially when comparing to a previous uh, platform like like the X2D. Flying characteristics. Uh, my opinion about Skydio flight characteristics is the same as it always was. Personally, not really a fan. Uh, I think that the the philosophy of relying heavily on an advanced obstacle avoidance system is great for some users. It means this is a platform that you can hand to anybody and they can employ it pretty effectively and they're not going to crash it. It may mean that they can't squeeze the performance out of it that they might be able to with another platform that they can fly more precisely. Um, that's my opinion. But nevertheless, uh, it's, it's remarkably easy to use, very feature-rich platform. There's no doubt it's going to get the job done. Sensors are great. Okay, so I guess the question is, uh, is this finally a uh, a North American made drone that has has reached parity with its Chinese competitors? 
It's hard to say because it's not really an apples to apples comparison. I would say in some areas, yes, in some areas, no. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to call a draw on that one. Uh, unless we're, unless we're, are we talking about performance or value? Well, we're talking, let's talk about performance. Do we have product parity? That's the question. Um, I, I can't answer that. It's too different of a platform. I, I think the, the you know the the basic design philosophy of the user experience is, is a little bit different. So I I'm I'm not willing to answer that. I do think it's a fantastic platform. Okay. I think it's comparable. Wow. Okay. So that's that's I mean that's great news for uh, for North American manufacturing for sure. Uh, and I think I think in fairness when uh, you know when Fraser talks about pricing options and things like that, there's there's no question that um, you're gonna pay more for an NDA compliant platform. And so our, our advice is, unless you specifically need an NDA compliant platform, don't get one, the, it's not worth it. And so, and this, this platform ultimately is, is, even though there's, there's product parity, it's not worth it. So if you can see the pricing, um, 23 to 30,000 uh, roughly. And so you can, you can tack onto this. One of the benefits I think is, is you are able to add um, you're able to add the night vision, which is going to cost you an extra 4,000 or so for the night flight. You can add 3D scan, which I believe is about another five or 6,000. So we've, we've quoted these things out. You get into almost 40,000. So you're paying a ton. You are getting some really cool additional features. There's no question about that at the higher end. So it's, it's really a question of uh, whether you use it. So if you have some really particular uh, inspections, uh, under bridges is is one of the things that that Skydio talks about a lot. Um, you know, then it's then it's absolutely worth checking out. Uh, but again, for that that price point, if you don't need NDA compliant, uh, it it's not. If you do need NDA compliant, you need to tune in this afternoon, and we'll uh, we'll go head to head with uh, the other NDA compliant uh, platforms that are available, kind of in the class. Um, and I will say before we kind of take questions, I'm I'm actually quite fascinated with this whole with this whole particular product category. And so I think strategically, um, strategically it's interesting. And I'll say this because uh, the Automax, the M3T, all of these have dramatically uh, lower sales than their projections. So uh, I think we and DJI and Autel expected the sales to be much higher. But the bottom line is this is an in-between pl platform. and the higher end and the lower end platforms are so good as we saw from some of the imagery. I think there's real questions about the overall viability of this particular size of, of products. And I think the challenge you have is you don't have interchangeable sensors, you do have a higher price point and your performance is much, much lower than you would get on the larger platform, be it an M30T or, or an Inspired or whatever you're gonna use with those. So I, I think there's a real, real challenge for um, for these price points. So, so from a Skydio perspective, and I understand they're doing it, they want longer flight times, it needs a bigger battery, they want to put more onboard computing, it's, it's defensible for all of these, but I really, really wonder about, about the long-term platform. And I think what we're already seeing is that, uh, and this will be your purchase decision, that they're going to say, you know what, I, if I'm going to spend that money, I want to go up a level so I can get interchangeable sun, uh, sensors, spotlights, all kinds of things. And all of these you can get parachutes are. Shout out to uh, to Joshy at ABSS, even though he called me a boomer, I'm not a boomer, uh, for the Skydio and also uh, also the M30T, those are available. So that, that's just an overall look. So I, I'm fascinated to see what's gonna happen with Skydio uh, and if they're gonna try and build a, a real replacement uh, for the X2D or if they've just kind of given up on that market and said, you know, this is how we're, uh, we're gonna compete. So, so let's point out there is one fundamental feature or, or capability you get with these that you do not get with the smaller platforms, which are otherwise sort of comparable. Uh, these are IP rated, right? So a lot of times when we hear people making the purchasing decision of let's say they're gonna go for an M30T instead of just a Mavic 3 thermal, it's often because it's IP rated. Uh, so I, I think it's interesting for you to, to think about the long-term um, viability of this category, especially if one day we have IP-rated smaller smaller platforms. Fantastic. Um, so great. So I think we're we're a little bit over. Sorry, there was lots of lots of stuff to talk about. So is there any um, specific questions 
you can uh, obviously you can email Fraser and I directly, uh, Kevin at rmus.ca and Fraser at rmus.ca if you have secret stuff. Um, anything else? Just fire them in the uh, in the chat box, and we will uh, we will answer uh, uh, anything that you might have right now. I'm glad we did this testing again. It's been a few years. It has. Um, it's always a lot of fun to get these all together, right? Uh, a little bit hectic, but it's been <laughs> fun. Yeah, it's it's not like we had a lot of room in the warehouse uh, <laughs> anyway. So, okay, last last call for your uh, for your questions. All right, and remember, uh, if you're interested in the uh, Blue SQAS 1.0 platforms, and then and then a little bit more on the uh, X10, even though it's technically it's a 2.0, not a 1.0, but we'll we'll put it in there anyway. Uh, join us at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern this afternoon. Uh, Ariel, we got the we got the link that we put. We already put it in the chat room. So uh, oh, fantastic. Okay. So everybody's uh, everybody's ready to go. So thank you again for uh, for joining us. Hope to see you this afternoon. Uh, and then our final session will be tomorrow at one o'clock p.m. for uh, Innovation Day, where we uh, talk to some uh, some end user innovators here in uh, the Great White North. So uh, until then, I am Kevin Todrell for. And Fraser Hahn. <laughs> you forgot who you were. We need to work no. on our outros a little bit. So Kevin Todrell and Fraser Hahn and Ariel in the control room making everything work. Thank you very much. And we will see you this afternoon.